Hello and welcome to the Digital Museum. Uh, today we have the archaeology of metals in ancient India with a special focus on the um, Iron Age of Tamil Nadu with Professor Sharada Srinivasan. Thank you so much for this wonderful um, invitation and uh, opportunity to be part of this uh, very exciting series on uh, art, archaeology, literature, and so on, and congratulations. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. So thank you for coming. Um, so what I want to ask you is that, I mean, obviously you have, uh, a, well, we've, uh, I've seen the pictures of you being awarded the, the, the Padma Sri for your contributions to archaeology. Um, can you tell me what in particular inspired them, do you think? Did they tell you what they were particularly impressed with to, to, to give you that award? Well, I think it, yes, it was in recognition for uh, the work uh, in archaeology and uh, that was what it was listed under. And of course, I think uh, it was a great uh, uh, recognition as far as I could see for uh, the community of archaeologists at large, which, uh, uh, you know, it's being a bit of an interdisciplinary niche subject, uh, you know, it really deserves, I think, a lot more of uh, attention and awards and accolades to encourage researchers. And also, I felt that it was also a recognition of um, women in STEM as well, because, uh, you know, my trajectory has also been one as uh, a person really making contributions in archaeological sciences, so to speak. And uh, I think also the citation did mention the interdisciplinarity and the fact that I also, uh, you know, had contributions in as a classical dancer and Bharatanatyam and so on. So uh, yes. perhaps I was just one of these oddballs, you know, <laughs> out of the box people who <laughs> somebody who truly come along the, too well. Uh, too truly often. marries the science and and the arts and culture in India uh, together. I think that together. was the yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're certainly dancing. the responses suggested that from the various <laughs> press and so on. Yes. Yeah, your your uh, dance is definitely very impressive. I mean, as somebody who uh, is totally in awe of people who can who can do that sort of classical dancing, uh, and and I cannot. Um, very impressive indeed. Uh, now, coming back to the archaeology, um, I know that uh, you also studied in London. You did your master's, I believe, in London. Do you want to uh, say a little bit about that? Yes, I guess uh, my trajectory was a bit unusual in the sense my uh, first degree was in uh, engineering physics from the Indian Institute of Technology um, in uh, what was then Bombay, which was um, of course, at that time, I was trying to emulate my father, who was also a very well-known scientist and so on. But I had all this exposure, uh, you know, to, of course, to dance, but also we used to do a lot of uh, traveling to monuments. And my mother also, a very adventurous lady who was heading World Wildlife Fund and so on. So we used to, so I had this adventurous streak, thanks to her, really, uh, having gone off to various places. And I really wanted to marry these interests. And then... So when I was doing my uh, BTEC really in IIT, I heard about the work that the Oxford Research Laboratory for Art and Archaeology were doing, you know, uh, trying to apply spectrochemical techniques in the study of archaeological objects and so on. And so that seemed to be um, an interesting career path for somebody like me with these diverse interests. And of course, in those days, and even now, I think this being a niche area, there were not so many opportunities uh, here in India. So I was very grateful for the opportunity to uh, uh, work in London. Um, so I was in touch, of course, with uh, SOAS, but also the Institute of Archaeology, which has one of the few departments of material science and conservation that there are, you know, and uh, one of the leading uh, such uh, institutions for this kind of research, which is long, with a long history and so on. And uh, I was also, of course, uh, in, uh, working with uh, some of the leading scholars there, uh, 
uh, late Professor Ian Glover, who of course is one of the very well-known Southeast Asian archeologists. And as you'll see some of his uh, work also, you know, we had a bearing on my trajectory and looking at the connections with Southeast Asia. We're grateful to you today for coming along and sharing some of the insights that you have in your work, because it's so you're going to be uh, talking about the archeology span and giving us a nice overview of some of the, the archeological finds and, and insights on, on um, archeology span of metals in India, but also talking about some of the techniques that you employ. Uh, so that's uh, something very uh, exciting for everybody to, to look forward to. Thank you again for this opportunity to talk about the archaeology of metals in ancient India. And I will be talking uh, mainly on the, uh, with the focus on the Iron Age and the early historic in Tamil Nadu, as mentioned uh, by Jibanisa. Thank you. Um, and as mentioned, uh, what I've been trying to do is to look at how the study of the metallurgical heritage uh, and metalworking techniques, you know, the discipline that's known as archaeometallurgy more broadly, what sort of light that can also throw on uh, historical aspects and archaeological aspects and uh, to understand those contexts a bit better. And uh, you're looking, of course, at a very uh, large open, uh, open cast copper working in Agnigandala region of Andhra Pradesh to give you a sense of uh, what we also try to do as archaeometallurgists, trying to look for the evidence for ancient mining and metallurgy. And uh, there's also a photograph here from the site of Kiridi in Tamil Nadu, which has been in the news a lot as one of the early uh, sites in Tamil Nadu, which uh, shows evidence and features of urbanism and so on. And uh, which has also uh, generated a lot of interest in looking at the early Tamil culture more closely. I'll just take you through a timeline um, of uh, uh, developments in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, of course, the presence of copper is already found in the Neolithic, which is associated with sites such as Mehergarh in Pakistan of about 6,000 BC. And then the mature Harappan uh, emerges around 2,500 BC around uh, sites such as Mohenjo-daro and Harappa in Pakistan, and also now uh, more sites in India being uncovered, such as Dholavira. And uh, the Chalcolithic deals with sites where you find uh, copper tools. Um, so it's not the kind of typical copper bronze repertoire that was um, developed by the Harappan period, but uh, what we call these, uh, the, the copper tools and lithic, uh, which resemble lithic tools in a way. So you have the copper antennae swords and so on. And recently, there's been a lot of interest in the site of Sanauli, which is dated to about 2000 BC in, in UP, where there has also been finds of a chariot burial with some copper elements and so on. And uh, generally, it had been thought that there was a bit of a hiatus after the Harappan civilization, but more of these finds are also interesting in that connection in terms of uh, filling these gaps uh, leading up to the historic periods and so on. In Southern India, uh, we have what is known as the Iron Age, which uh, emerges at least by about 1500 BCE. And the Peninsular Iron Age uh, or Megalithic also overlaps a bit into the early historic. And typically uh, it is also described as Megalithic because there are uh, many stone formations such as circles and dolmens and cis burials and so on uh, connected to various burial and funerary practices and so on. And uh, then when you, as I said, the in, in Southern India, the megalithic sort of overlaps into the early historic because you find some of these stone uh, cairns and so on continuing quite late. And uh, of course, you also have the second urbanization, which is found in the Gangetic Valley and uh, uh, in the Mauryan uh, the rakes are also found all the way down as far down as Muski in southern India. And in fact, the Shabazz Gari edict uh, in Pakistan also mentions the uh, dynasties of the extreme south, the Cholas and the Cheras and the Pandyas. 
So this is another uh, interesting area, uh, the extreme south in the Tamil region, where there is this body of literature or poetry, which is loosely dated to about the third century BC to third century CE. And that has also been uh, dated um, in the light of some of the Jain uh, rock cut uh, caves in Tamil Nadu of about the third century BC and so on. And then of course you have with uh, Alexander's incursions and so on in the Northwest, the Hellenistic influences and other kinds of influences from West Asia, of course, Sasanian and so on, uh, which come in through the land route in Northern India. But in Southern India, there are a lot of the influences also coming in from the maritime routes and also from the Hellenistic and Roman world. And uh, when we look at the mature Harappan we already see the emergence of a copper bronze repertoire. And the most famous example of this is, of course, the dancing girl from Mohenjo-daro, dated to about 2500 BCE in Pakistan. And although it's a really tiny figurine, what is also very striking is the aspects of similarity with uh, various indigenous practices and so on, which still continue in India. For instance, the Kota women of the Nilgiris also wear their hair in what they call the polkut, this sideways turned bun, which you also see among the Gond uh, communities in central India. And you see that she has an arm full of bangles, uh, and typically the Rabari women in Gujarat and so on, and uh, uh, who also are found around the area of Dholavira and so on, they still wear these shell bangles, you know, the arm full of shell bangles and so on. Well, you're looking at the citadel of uh, Dholavira here, which is made of these limestone blocks, and some of them are quite beautifully dressed and so on. And there is, of course, a lot of copper and bronze being found also at Dholavira. And this is a rather mineralized example of copper debris from the southern reservoir that you're looking at here, which I had analyzed and so on. And of course, the Mohenjadaro dancing girl is also thought to be made of the lost wax technique. And uh, this lost wax technique also continues uh, in the subcontinent and it seems to flourish and really come into its own in the late medieval, sorry, the early medieval Chola period, uh, the 10th century bronzes, uh, which were cast of these magnific magnificent icons. And the best known of them is the Nataraja bronze of the Hindu god Shiva as a lot of dance depicting Shiva balancing the drum of creation and the fire of destruction and dancing on the dwarf demon Apasmara. And the lost wax technique is still practiced by communities of traditional and uh, hereditary class people in places such as Swami Malay in Tanjavu district, where typically an image is first carved of the icon to be cast in wax, and then it is invested with numerous layers of clay to form the mold. And then the mold is heated and the metal to be cast is melted and poured into the mold. And then it is broken and then the icon is retrieved and so on. And so some of my early investigations uh, on Southern Indian material was in fact on these lost wax, on these lost wax bronzes and the Chola bronzes. And this image, for instance, um, I had analyzed and found that it had 8% tin and 8% uh, lead. So this is really what we call a leaded bronze, because typically tin is added to copper to harden it, so that bronze is actually harder than copper. But then bronze is not very castable usually, so lead is added to also make the bronze more castable, so to speak. Well, coming to uh, the early material culture in Tamil Nadu. One of the best known sites is Adi Chanlulur in uh, the southern part of Tamil Nadu, which is in the Thirnal Valley district by the Tamrapani River. And this is in fact one of the richest um, early sites where, um, and also rather enigmatic material in a way, this early material. And uh, scores of Iron Age burials were uncovered and in around the 1900s, there is uh, uh, excavations or rather uh, uh, the unearthing of some of this material was done by Jagor and Rie and so on. And uh, the material included 
urns and uh, gold ornaments and a lot of iron implements and swords and spears and so on, and uh, some rather intriguing vessels and so on, which I'll come to later. And of course, since these were not very systematically excavated, it's been rather difficult to attribute very firm dates, but it has been loosely uh, attributed to 800 BC to various scholars such as the Olchins. And one of the very intriguing uh, figures here is of this female figurine, which is described as a mother goddess, which bears quite a lot of uh, resemblance to the Harappan mother goddess terracottas in the style with the belt at the level of the hips and also the hairdress and so on. And some of the other uh, kinds of finds include gold repousse, uh, uh, the ornaments which could have formed headbands or mouthpieces and so on. So we don't quite know what the function was in that sense. And in a 2000 season, there were further excavations which were made at Adi Shanilur to yield a lot of these urn burials. Uh, and you're looking at one of those examples. And one of the fragments of the terracotta urns also showed uh, quite a lively um, artwork consisting of a lady and an antelope and a lizard and something which reminds me a bit of a cattle egret and so on. And what is also interesting, of course, is that the uh, Tamil Sangam poems also refer to urn burials. For instance, there's one of the poems in the Purananuru in which uh, uh, you know, the potter is urged to make an urn which could hold a chieftain and he's asked to make the urn using the mountain as a clay and the land as the wheel. Some of the excavations which were also made by uh, French archaeologists in the earlier part of the 20th century also uh, yielded some interesting material from the site of Sutakeni, which is dated to the second century BCE. And uh, this yielded a terracotta sarcophagus as well as several gold implements and gold ornaments and so on, which are in the Musée Guinée now. And in the 90s, excavations were undertaken on another important megalithic site, which is both a burial cum habitation site, which is Kodumanal. And uh, you're seeing in that photograph a, a bit of the cis burial and some of the men here and so on. And more recently in the past few years, the site of Kiridi has been excavated which also has a carbon date of 6th century BCE. And uh, what is interesting about this site is that it has yielded some uh, paved uh, elements of paved streets as well as a ring well and so on. And the Tamil Sangam epics and the Silapadikaram uh, in the Madurai Kandam also speak of the streets of Madurai and so on. And there are also these uh, fragments of pottery with graffiti and some of them also, uh, of course, are related to the Tamil Brahmi uh, writing, as well as some relics of Indus signs and so on. And there's been some finds of gold ornaments and so on. So all of this has resulted in uh, more interest in looking at this uh, early Tamil material. Now, coming back to Adi Chinalur, one of the early analyses by Paramashivan in the 1940s pointed to the find of a bronze of 22% tin, but uh, it had not generated too much interest at that time. And uh, Lawrence Leshnik in 1974, when he wrote his book, The Pandukal Complex on the megalithic uh, sites also reported a bronze of 21% tin. And it was generally thought that these were imported from elsewhere because it did not seem as if the uh, material culture associated with the megaliths and so on was really sophisticated enough to be producing these kind of bronzes. And uh, so some of my work has been to go back to look at this material. And you're looking at here at two of the uh, bronze vessels from Adi Chanalur. And uh, what I found actually was that these are made by a specialized process where uh, unleaded heightened bronze uh, is has been used in early antiquity in southern India, optimizing the presence of a beta phase compound of composition of 22.9% tin, which is an intermetallic compound. And this results in properties of high hot forgeability, 
lower brickiness on quenching and musicality and golden luster on polishing. And just to explain the significance, just at the top, you can see a microstructure of an as cast leaded low tin bronze. So what happens as I was mentioning, when you add lead to low tin bronze, it becomes more castable. So that is typically a dendritic structure. And most bronzes that you find in antiquity have either less than about 15% tin, or if they have more, they're typically leaded so that uh, they are more castable. Because as you keep adding tin to bronze, it actually becomes more and more brittle. So that's also why you don't have bronzes with more than about 20% tin just found as unleaded binary height and bronzes. But it seems that in this, in some of these vessels, they were deliberately aiming for this composition of 23% tin bronze. And if you look at that phase diagram, which typically plots the changes as you keep adding tin to copper and as you keep increasing the temperature, so you see that around 23% tin at a temperature of about 600 to 700 degrees centigrade, you get the formation of this beta phase. And it seems that they were deliberately aiming for this composition and then hot forging uh, this bronze at a high temperature by repeated cycles of annealing and hot forging. And then what is very crucial is that they were quenching the bronze. Quenching means they were rapidly cooling it down from that beta phase uh, temperature range to uh, the, the normal temperature. And that quenching was very important because if they didn't do that, and if it slow cooled, then you get the formation of a very embrittling uh, alpha plus delta eutectoid phase. And so they were really trying to aim for that quenched beta uh, composition. And so you're looking at a microstructure of this uh, bronze vessel from Adi Chinlur, and you can see these long elongated needles of martensitic beta phase. So that's how you can tell that this is a rotten quenched beta bronze. And in fact, really it's very spectacular formation of martensite there. And it also seems that this beta phase is actually very plastic. In fact, I've done a study with uh, late Oleg Sherby, which showed that it is actually quasi super plastic. So they were able to really uh, do very extensive hot forging at high temperatures. And that's why they were able to get these vessels with very, very thin rims. And just to, to explain to you what would happen if the quenching did not take place, I've put this microstructure at the bottom of a 19% tin bronze vessel, which has not been quenched. And you can see there the formation of this alpha plus delta eutectoid network, which is bluish between the grains. And that is really what embrittles the bronze. And that's why the quenching is very important. Now, what was also important was that I was able to find that the ancient traditions are also still practiced in Southern India in some of the workshops of the traditional community, community of bronze workers, the Kamalar. And here you're looking at a vessel from another site, which is uh, from the Nilgiris. Now, the Nilgiris are a very beautiful range of mountains which are bordering uh, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. And there are a lot of cairns here. And uh, about 250 years ago now, the British had uh, started getting into the Nilgiris. And mainly there were a lot of indigenous communities living there, such as the Todas and the Kotas and Badakas and so on. And uh, Greeks and various other uh, figures in the 19th century unearthed a lot of these vessels from the Nilgiri cairns. And many of them are very sophisticated, really, with very thin rims and complex fluted shapes and decorations and so on. And the, some of them have gone to the Government Museum Chennai, and some of them are in the British Museum. And many of them are found to be of this heightened 23% beta bronze with a rotten quench uh, microstructure. And these are some of the finest examples known anywhere. So next to that structure of the old Nilgiri vessel, you see this very shiny vessel, which is a new vessel, which I had uh, observed the manufacture of in Kerala. And so you can see there, the base of that vessel shows the diameter of an ingot of about uh, a, a smaller diameter of the ingot, the flat ingot, which is then hot forged. The ingot is about 15 centimeters, and then it is extensively hot forged to get this uh, shape of about uh, 30 centimeters or so. And the outer skin, of course, has been left unpolished. It's really the microstructural analysis which um, helps you to 
piece together how the, the technology of how the artifact was made. In this case, the microstructure shows you very clearly that it's um, this rotten quenched beta bronze because you see this needle-like beta phase, which you would not see if it was not quenched. And it's quite extensively um, hot forged and then quenched, you know, any link, the cycles of any link, hot forging and then quenching. And I was also able to find a modern uh, contemporary practice of making these heightened bronze vessels, because otherwise you might have said there's no real reason why we should think that they should have been made in India. But I've shown that there's a very longstanding ethnographic tradition as well. And you're looking at a vessel which has been uh, recently made where the ingot at the bottom of about 15 centimeter has been um, very heavily hot forged and quenched. And why this is significant, because bronze as such does not take so much of hot forging as such. It is because this plastic beta phase composition was being aimed for that you're able to get this. And at the same time, it has a lot of tensile strength and so on. And it has this very brilliant golden polish, which is why it was being sought. And it's also a very musical alloy. So in fact, it was also used to make a lot of musical instruments. And you see that the microstructure of the a recent vessel is exactly the same as what you saw in the past. So that, that's how you're able to piece together how it was done in the past. So that's why ethnography of metalworking also becomes very useful. And I was just going to run you through the actual process of making uh, these vessels, which I had documented amongst the Kamalar, who are a bronze working community in Kerala. And of course, they were spread over Tamil Nadu and so on. But They've mostly stopped doing this uh, particular Rotupatram uh, vessel making, um, and it's mainly in these pockets that it has survived in Kerala. So you see that the, um, the blank is being annealed on the flame to reach this temperature of 600 degrees, uh, this cast blank of 23% in. And then they use these very large hammers and alternately kind of uh, forge it in these cycles and all that. So, and, and here, in fact, they've stacked several vessels together, so it looks rather thick. But you can see the effort go on, going into it from that kind of thickness to get it down to that extraordinary thinness that we saw. And then you can also see the quenching process. And then after it is quenched, they also do a lot of polishing of the um, vessel. So you get that very brilliant um, uh, polished look, which was also probably why they uh, were uh, these vessels were sought after because it, it takes a very golden polish and so on. As I was saying, again, with the Nilgiri vessels, they were not been very well dated because many of them were collected from cairns and so on. And they also have these very uh, delicate patterns, these lotus patterns and so on, incise patterns. And uh, again, it had been thought that because they were so sophisticated in a way that they may have come from somewhere else. But as I was also pointing out, some of these workshops, they still follow many of these practices. In fact, when I was there in uh, Parangadi in Kerala in 91, they were using these hand lathes still where they mount the vessel onto a lathe and then they use these uh, steel uh, chisels and so on and points to make the patterns. And you can also see the evidence of this lathe turning, for example, on this vessel at the bottom from the Nilgiris, where you see the lines from the lathe turning as well, apart from all these lotus motifs and such like. Uh, we do have some better dates for the Vidarbha megalithic material, which is excavated by the Deccan College, um, by S.P. Deo and so on. For instance, Mahojari gave a date of about 7th century BC. And at the top there, you're looking at a vessel from Boregaon, the Vidarbha megaliths, which I had also analyzed. And that is also a cast and quenched beta bronze. It has, in this case, not quite the 23% composition, but getting there, 21% uh, tin. So it is what it has got an alpha plus beta composition. So you see the dendritic alpha phase and then the quenched martensitic beta phase. But this is a more lightly cast and quenched. It's not very heavily forged. But what is significant is that it, it points to this tradition um, uh, going back to the 7th century BC date. And some of the other material, Anichinur and Nilgiris, can also be dated back to uh, the early to mid first millennium BCE. So that's not out of place. And what's also interesting is that at Marjorie, you also find um, other kinds of bronze working, which are again unleaded, uh, experimenting with unleaded tin bronze, for instance, you have a 12% tin bronze rod and so on. So uh, you get a sense of the trajectory. And it's also very interesting that this is one of the few vessels from Marjorie with a finial in this sense. But again, this is very similar to what we are finding more and more from the Tamil culture, the vessels with uh, finials. 
for instance, there was a copper alloy finial jar excavated by Ramesh, which has very similar kind of, uh, it looks almost like the, the, the some some element of a flower, the the, uh, the the kind of the rays with the pistils and the stems and so on. And then you also have this other finial jar, which is quite spectacular, which is excavated from Auroville of 500 BCE, which has uh, these finials with these cattle egrets sitting all around what seems to be a humpbacked uh, uh, bull. And uh, so the, these kinds of finial vessels uh, are being found more and more from uh, various parts of southern India and also connecting to this peninsula material. Now, and there are also these similarities between uh, material from Bandontapet, which is a site which is quite well dated again to about 4th century BCE in Thailand, with some of the early Tamil finds, such as from uh, the excavations in Auroville that I've been talking about, 500 BC, apart from Adichinalur and Nilgiris and so on. And of course, Bandontapet had also been uh, worked, at, worked on a lot in the 70s and 80s, also by uh, Leti and Glover and uh, various other scholars, uh, Raj Peter, Axili, Anna Bennett, and so on. And also then Vince Piggott and Elizabeth Moore and various, various other people. And out of about 500 uh, bronze uh, containers, about 25 of these were of uh, tin content of more than about 20%. And uh, you also find, for instance, this carnelian uh, feline from Bandontapet and from Kodumanel from 3rd century BCE in Tamil Nadu. You also find this tiger, a copper alloy figurine, which is inlaid with carnelian, carnelian and lapis lazuli. So again, these similarities come to mind. And in fact, uh, from uh, Ravi Perumal's excavation in Auroville, you find a lot of these vessels with the finials which are also laid down in, in ways that remind you of the Bandon, the pet material. And now the finds more and more of heightened bronzes from various contexts in Southern India as well. And another feature of some of these heightened bronze vessels is the presence of this knob base, which you see particularly in some of the vessels from the Nilgiris and also in this Adichin Noor vessel. Um, and of course, in this case, the knob is part of the forging process itself. It's not added on and it has these rings around it. And it recalls to other kinds of uh, similar depictions. For instance, there is this granite bowl from Stupa 41 in Taxila, which is in the British Museum, where you see this knob and the rings around it. And you see other examples of Indian knobware pottery. And one explanation could be that this knob represents the Mount Meru as pointed out by Ian Glover. And from Bandontapet also you see these knob-based vessels, but they're not actually as well made, I would say, as the examples from Tamil Nadu and so on. And uh, you can see that it is also made by a process which is mainly uh, lightly cast and quenched. It's not really hot forged in the same way. You have a lot of the um, uh, remnant dendritic pattern is still there. And at the bottom is another microstructure of uh, bronze vessel from the Nilgiris, which is again a heightened beta bronze, which shows extensive hot forging and quenching, because again, you see the extensive formation of this quenched martensite. So what I'm trying to say is that the Tamil examples seem to have been much more heavily hot forged and quenched and so on, um, as far as we can uh, tell. So that, that technology seems to have been taken to, uh, you know, to, uh, it's, to uh, much further in these Tamil examples. And we also see that there are other aspects of similarity between the material culture in terms of the finds from Bandantapet and the Tamil sites, such as um, uh, there was also a cock and peacock, which is found from Bandantapet. And you also see these terracotta vessels with the bird finial. And you also see a cock finial, metal finial from Adichinalur, which is dated to the early uh, first millennium BC. You also see these uh, metal finials with uh, these representations of goats and so on. And another excavation from Ravi Perumal showed this urn with a finial and a rather spectacular peacock. Now, it's also interesting that the Tamil Sangam literature also talks about uh, um, the Togai, for example, makes reference to uh, Shavakam, which is thought to refer to the island of Java. And also in the Tamil Sangam uh, literature, you have a reference to, um, uh, you know, 
to the worship of Murugan, who's associated with uh, the, the Tamil folk deity, who's associated with the peacock and the cock and so on. So there is also these uh, interesting aspects of, um, uh, of connections in a way and what the significance of these kind of finial vessels is, we don't know, but there are these um, aspects of connection. This is a map which just points to some of these finds of heightened bronzes, which are roughly dated from about the period of early to late first millennium BC from the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia and continuing ethnographic finds, of course, which I've also pointed to. And uh, of course, many of them uh, uh, have also been studied by me, but uh, there are a few that have been studied by other scholars. Uh, such as Tilpi uh, by Chattopadhyay, though of course the Tilpi finds are actually more 19% in bronze. It's not really the pure beta phase of 23% in, but it shows that there is the use of hyatin bronzes in various other places. Now, it's quite interesting that Strabo's geography mentions that uh, Nyakas, uh, who was Alexander's general around 326 BC, observed that Indians made vessels which shattered when dropped. So it had been pointed out also by Rajpita Kinsili that this actually suggested that in the Hellenistic world, they did not actually know of this kind of vessel type. And it's not really found that much in Europe, the heightened bronze alloy as, as we seem to find in the subcontinent. Um, and when you look at that description of vessels shattering when uh, dropped, that's also because as I said, the quenching reduces the brittleness of the heightened bronze, but still it can still uh, shatter quite easily when dropped. And in fact, that was how I came to even think about looking for ethnographic practices of heightened bronze working in the Indian subcontinent, because before I actually identified those, there was no parallel of ethnographic studies of heightened bronzes, um, uh, certainly in, in, in the Indian subcontinent. It was because my grandmother, when I was talking to her, she mentioned these Otupatram and the Talavetu and so on, which uh, were made still in Kerala and so on, which which they had to be careful that they didn't drop them because they broke like pottery. That's exactly what she said, which was so similar to the account in Strabo's geography. Now you're looking here also at a vessel, early historic vessel in Taxila. So obviously at some point with the Hellenistic influence and so on, you, you do see perhaps that these started, uh, you know, being made there as well, but they are not uh, elaborately decorated in the way the Nilgiri height and bronze vessels are. And I also studied a fragment of a 24% uh, height and bronze from uh, Taxila, which was given to me by Ian Glover, which was also from Pakistan. So um, one can see that this tradition was uh, spread over the subcontinent and still continuing in, in many places, I would say, at least till quite recently. Another very extraordinary aspect of particularly the Tamil uh, height and bronzes are the fact that some of them are what we can call as trainers. Uh, particularly from Adi Chanilur and Kodumanal, uh, with these very extraordinary perforated patterns. And as you can see, the rim thinness is also so very less, about 0.2 millimeter, uh, millimeters thinness. And in that as well, they've made these very, very fine perforations. And uh, you're looking here at a backscatter image of a uh, microstructure using electron probe microanalysis of the strainer fragment from Adi Chanilur. And in fact, this is of a slightly higher phase as well. It's called uh, the quenched gamma phase because as the alloy cools down from the beta phase temperature, uh, then there is the formation of the gamma phase which happens before it goes to delta. So this is the quenched gamma phase, which is even harder, three, 390 VPN or so. And uh, it seems to have actually been quite a resilient alloy and probably because of the hardness, they could make these perforations as well. And there's also this um, vessel from Kodumanal, which is really quite spectacular, third century BC, which is from the megalithic excavation of the State Department of Archaeology in Tamil Nadu, which I had also analyzed by EPMA, electron probe microanalysis, and found it to be of quenched 22% in bronze. And it has this perforated floral pattern, in, including very large birds. And the large birds you also see, for example, on the graffiti in Adich Nur. And how this would have been forged, um, I've also seen them making symbols in similar ways. They use a particular kind of stone anvil, which is shaped like that, with bowl shape, so that you can uh, you know, forge it and bang it out into that shape more easily. You have the st strainer from Kodumanal, and you can see these very, very tiny holes really, you know, which is in this case about one to two millimeters and how they actually went about making such tiny perforations. 
And um, now in Kodumanel, they were also using um, uh, the technique of diamond drilling, which of course goes back to the Indus and Harappan uh, tradition. Um, and you can see these quartz beads, which have seem to have also been cut with a diamond wheel because quartz again is a very hard material. And you can see that, uh, and in fact, uh, Rajan who excavated Kodumanel had many years back even recorded the use of diamond bow drilling in uh, around uh, the region of uh, Kodumanel and so on, which is now uh, completely died out. So it's possible that these um, holes were being made by diamond drilling and that had also been postulated with respect to the decorated uh, early historic height and bronze fragment from Thailand, which had been uh, examined by Glover and so on. And of course, uh, he had also postulated that that particular decorated height and bronze was uh, directly from India because it has a decorative uh, figure on it, you know, the figure and representation is much more like what you would find in early historic um, uh, India, whether it is Shatavahana, Sunga, and so on. So the likelihood that this uh, was Indian is what they postulated and then is found in Thailand. And that also seems to have been cut with a diamond wheel. And in Adichinlur as well, uh, in this height and bronze, you have uh, the signs again of using uh, a lathe and a uh, very fine point, which I don't know how you could have got steel to, 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 to give such a fine point. And that's why we think it could have been a fine diamond point. And again, you see that also in the Nilgiri uh, height and bronze vessel at the bottom. And of course, uh, there's also a microstructure here of uh, another strainer, which also shows this experimenting with different compositions of uh, bronze here, in this case with 12% in bronze and so on. This is just to show some of the analyses of some of these vessels, because I've been just talking about this 23% composition, but here you can see uh, some of the vessels from the Nilgiris and Adi Chinlur. Uh, the tin content is quite a narrow band of about 22 to uh, 23%, and there's no lead in it or any other uh, alloying elements. And this tradition also continued in South India for a long time. Of course, we've seen the continuing tradition, but I've also looked at some Chola vessels which have a similar composition uh, aiming for this height and bronze, 23-24% uh, in bronze composition. And uh, what was also interesting, of course, is that we've been finding these vessels in the Nilgiri Cairns, but uh, when I'd done some uh, ethnographic documentation with, in, in the Toda communities and in, in the Nilgiris, um, and also with my husband, Adik Vijay Mala, who's, uh, who knows the Nilgiris very well, um, and so we're here at one of the Toda uh, uh, dairy temples. And uh, so this Toda priest, he took me to uh, his house and many of them actually have many of these extraordinary height and bronze vessels, which they've been collecting and hoarding over a long time. And other uh, Toda scholars like Ivan Piljim have also shown me uh, such vessels. And of course, I'm also exploring whether one of the other communities, which I didn't have time to touch upon here, the Kotas or blacksmiths, um, you know, in terms of being metalsmiths and, you know, there's also a lot to be explored there about whether these practices were also being followed. And another interesting aspect is the um, way in which the decoration was done such that, as you can see here at the bottom, you see a vessel uh, by uh, the Kamalar Bhaskar in Kerala where the inside has been polished and the outside has le been left uh, unpolished and unquenched. And you can also see that designs have been made. For example, there is this early historic bowl from Thailand, from Kao Sam Kyo, where you see another figurative design. As I said, again, um, Ian Glover thought that this would be more likely from uh, an Indian provenance because of the style, uh, very much like early historic material in India. But you can see here that it's the outer skin which has been uh, worked. Um, and, and incised. And that's something you also find in other vessels, for instance, one from Orissa and one from Tamil Nadu and one from Kerala. These are all of recent vintage. And um, in Orissa, these kinds of heightened bronze workers are also known as Kangsa Banik. And this term Kangsa is also encountered in Southeast Asia. And the term uh, Kamalar, of course, also relates, which we use in Tamil Nadu and Kerala and so on. Kamsale is also used in Karnataka. So these also relate to the Sanskrit term Kamsatala, which is also found, for instance, in the Arthashastra and so on. So they again uh, seem to be longstanding traditions. And But what was interesting, of course, is this Tamil word, Otapatram and Vettil, 
I was on some Facebook page and I found that somebody from Sindh told me that it's called Watao, uh, you know, the same kind of thing which looked like height and bronze. And, you know, so, and then I thought that this Tamil word seems closest to the Sindhi word Watao or Red Till. So, again, I think there are a lot of interesting connections. Since we've talked about the bronze working, I just wanted to say that one can't see it in isolation because there is evidence for skilled uh, ferrous metallurgy tracing back to the Iron Age as seen in the saga of wood steel. Now, this term woods is believed to be a Europeanized version of the word uk for steel in South Indian languages, which was encountered by European travelers in the colonial era. Now, the novelty of wood steel uh, is because it is a high carbon steel with about 1 to 1.5 percent carbon, which was not really widely known in Europe. And it is thought to have been exported to forge uh, these Damascus blades, which I'll explain. Now, I've put in this phase diagram, the iron carbon phase diagram, more to explain to you that when we are talking about wrought iron, we are talking about uh, an alloy which has very little uh, carbon, less than about 0.04% carbon. And I didn't put this uh, photograph in here, but of course, you would all be familiar with the spectacular Delhi iron pillar, which is a massive, uh, uh, in, in, it's one of the largest um, iron forgings, uh, massive iron forgings in the world. And uh, but when we talk about uh, steel and high carbon steel, uh, basically the addition of carbon to iron made it harder and harder. And um, now in general in the world, we use mild steel, which has less than about 0.04%, uh, uh, well, less than about 0.4% uh, carbon. But the interesting aspect of the wood steel was that it had a carbon content of about 1.5% carbon. Uh, in in uh, in the iron, and actually to keep adding carbon to iron in Europe, they really followed what was called a solid state cementation process, where uh, you know, of course, when you heat uh, the iron itself in very reducing conditions, some carbon gets in. But what was the novelty about boots was that they had discovered a way in which you can carburize wrought iron in crucibles so that uh, packing it with carbonaceous materials and so on, so that the carbon could get in and you get this ultra high carbon steel composition of about 1.5%. And this steel had very good properties where it had a very good cutting edge and uh, very uh, good tensile strength and so on, which is why it was much sought after. And what you're looking at is a cake of steel as it is described. And these kinds of cakes were being exported from southern India in the 17th century in shipments of tens of thousands of ingots, for instance, from Golconda to Persia and West Asia, and an almost an industrial enterprise. The reason why the steel was so much sought after is that the forging of that ingot resulted in this alternating pattern of uh, the dark pearlite and the light cementite, which you see there, this wavy pattern, which was known as the Damask, the word in Arabic, uh, 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 which actually relates to, uh, the, the term Damask also relates to watered silk. It, it's kind of, uh, you know, the kind of pattern of light and dark and so on. It's, it's quite a lovely term in its way. And that's why these were called the Damascus blades also. Although, and also it was forged, um, you know, very extensively in the Arab world and so on to make these uh, swords, which had a very good cutting edge and other kinds of properties. I don't have that much time to go into it. But anyway, this is to show you also um, an example of the sword of Tipu Sultan in the National Museum, which when you look at it closely, you can see this light and dark pattern from the etching of the forged wood steel. And next to it is a mural from Darya Daulat Bagh in Shirangapatna, which is Tipu Summer Palace, 18th century mural, which depicts the Nizam of Hyderabad with a shamsir or sword. And in fact, it is really from Golconda that you see a lot of accounts from the 16th century by Tavernier and so on of the making of these cakes of wood steel. But what is interesting is that there is, it is a longstanding tradition again in South India. And as I said, the, the roots go back to this um, Iron Age early historic period again. And this is a one of the sites that I identified in Mail Siravalu, just to explain the process, which is near Tiruvannamalai. And you see these uh, fragments of these crucible, uh, crucibles which are used for making steel. And if you can just imagine, if you put that all together, it gives you the shape of that cake of the steel. So the wrought iron was being kept in these crucibles along with this carbonaceous material, and then uh, which was fired in these very uh, long firing cycles at very high temperatures and getting carburized to steel. 
And at the bottom, you also see some remnants around male cervelur of uh, the legs of megalithic sarcophagi and all that, because it's shown some uh, traces also of megalithic uh, occupation. What I had done was to look at the microstructural studies of the fragment of the crucible. And you see these trapped prills, which are basically the globules of the metal content which was uh, prepared in these crucibles. And you can see that that microstructure is what we call a typical ultra, hyper, uh, uh, ultra high carbon steel, hyper eutectoid steel as it's called, because you can see the perlite, the dark perlite network. And then there is this honeycomb like structure of the cementite, the white cementite. And when you look at that, you also understand how uh, that uh, the, 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 the Damascus blades you know, the, how it resulted in that structure of the Damascus blades. Because when you forge this extensively, then you, and then when you etch it, you get this light and dark pattern of the perlite and the cementite and so on. And uh, this is also to show you that, uh, of course, the analysis was done by electron probe microanalysis to confirm the composition and so on. And another aspect was, of course, the, the wrought iron was packed with the carbonaceous material, but the crucible also had to be very highly refractory to be able to uh, result in those very high temperatures that you would have needed for this process of about 1200, at least, uh, if not 1300 degrees centigrade and so on. And the uh, crucible was also packed with coked rice hull relics and so on, which contributed to the silicious uh, nature of the refractory and such like. This term woods may also derive from the old Tamil word wukku or uruku, which refers to the process of melting and you still find it being used, in fact, in uh, the foundries and so on that I've been to. And the term yegu also describes peers in the Tamil Sangam texts, such as from the third century BC to third century CE, such as the bardic poems of the poetess Avayar, who's supposed to be a very grand lady. And there's a beautiful one to the chieftain Anchi, which goes, Anchi, man of many spears, is, as, is at battle. Black battle smoke swirls from around uh, like mists around mountain peaks, around his young elephants and so on. So, I mean, they were always continually, uh, you know, in, in battle mode and so on. So this is what uh, we get from some of this tradition, perhaps was used to make spears. And some of them you still see in uh, Ardich and Lur of the first millennium BCE. And at the bottom, you see also a surviving tradition in Tiruvannamalai, in Singarapete, the traditional community of Karuman, Vishwakarman and so on. Um, and you also get a lot of iron ores in this region. And this is to also point to our book, uh, India's Legendary Wood Steel. And there's also a count of, Zo uh, of Zosimus, the Greek in the fourth century, which mentions that the Indians uh, made weapons by fusing iron in, in crucibles, which just sounds like uh, what I've been talking about. So this is another uh, example of, uh, from Megalithic Kodumanel, which you've already talked about. And there's some crucible fragments found here, which was in an iron smelting furnace. And I had done the, my, the uh, microstructural analysis and also used a technique called electron probe microanalysis with dot mapping, which means that you can actually map the elemental concentration across the cross section. And you can see where the, the prills, the metallic prills of iron uh, or steel or whatever are concentrating in that cross section. So you can, uh, this also confirms that these crucibles were used for ferrous metal processing. And there's also a microstructure of a chisel here from Kodumanel, which has a similar honeycomb structure related to um, high carbon steel. And it's also interesting that um, the, uh, there are references to co both Kodumanel is referred Kodumanan and Karur, which is near it, is, was also the old Sangam Chera capital. And um, in fact, there are also the Roman accounts which mention iron from the Ceres and so on. And some uh, scholars like Warmington, of course, there have been other disagreements. Some have suggested that this might refer to the Chera kingdom. And Tamil Sangam literature also mentions the active trade with the Yavanas or the Mediterranean people, the Ionians and so on. And there is this beautiful gold signet ring from Karur of the first century, which in fact is a, a amalgam of the Indian and Roman styles of a Mithuna figure. More recently, the site of Musiris Patanam has also been excavated by uh, the Kerala Council for Historic Research. And there is extensive evidence there for Indo-Roman trade and contacts and so on of the first century. And I had analyzed some of the iron nails. And you can see here, this is a classic uh, hyper structure of high carbon steel. 
And so perhaps some of this deal was also a part of what was being sought after or, uh, or um, exported. And you can also see the remnants of this uh, wharf with the canoe um, pointing to the maritime connections and a rather uh, spectacular intaglio, a carnelian intaglio of the Roman goddess Fortuna. And I also sort of thought I'd point to the evidence from um, an earlier megalithic site, which is Kadibaklenia Hampi in Karnataka, where you see that this, this site is quite well dated and excavated by uh, the team of Kathleen Morrison and Carla Sinopoli from University of Chicago and University of Michigan and so on, along with the State Archaeology of Karnataka. And I had done some of the analysis of the metal uh, from the ferrous remnants. And you can see here uh, the um, upper terrace area of Kadibakle, which is not far from uh, Hampi. And uh, there was an iron ring here, which um, already shows this is a, a higher carbon steel of about 0.8% carbon. You can see this perlite matrix already. And if you look at low carbon uh, uh, raw iron, it's a completely different structure. We just mainly see the ferrite phase. So uh, you'd have to look at that to, to believe me, but this is a higher carbon steel. So it seems that this was already being experimented with, and that's uh, you know what would have resulted in the its composition. This also uh, takes a lot of work to unpack, but I'll just point to um, a couple of uh, examples where one can use, for example, the technique of lead isotope ratio analysis for provenancing some artifacts, because basically um, lead has this characteristic that the isotopic ratios uh, vary distinctly across different ore sources and distinctly and measurably. And also the lead, which is used in an artifact, uh, you know, unlike the trace elements and so on, that the isotopic ratio remains the same from the ore to the artifact. So basically you can, base, if, if the lead isotope ratios of an artifact match a particular ore, it's quite like, it's very likely that it's because it's coming from that ore source. So it's a way of provenancing the artifacts. Of course, there are a lot of other complications and I used it quite successfully on the medieval South Indian bronzes, but I'm not going to touch upon that here. But I'll point to some examples. Of course, we don't have an exhaustive base uh, for Indian ore deposits, but since I'm talking about the early historic in Southern India, for example, there were some Shatavahana coins, which you can see very clearly that they, of course, these are silver coins, but then the silver is also has, uh, they are from uh, polymetallic deposits, which also have lead and so on in them. And so there are traces of lead also in the silver coins. And uh, one set of Shatavahana coins very clearly matched uh, the mine of Agni Gundala in Andhra Pradesh. I showed you a, a slide of Agni Gundala right in the beginning uh, when we started off. So some of them, the metal is from Andhra, but another uh, batch of them actually matched the Sardinian uh, ore source of Fluminis. And we also know about the Roman contacts. Obviously there was some metal also coming in from the Roman world. So there are all these kinds of nuances that you can pick up. And you're looking here also at a Andhra Vishnukundin coin of the fourth century, which was struck and uh, hot, uh, it is a, a beta bronze, 23% tin bronze. So you can see here that the plasticity of this beta bronze was used for uh, also forging coinage. And this is quite unique. I don't think there are any other examples of beta bronze coins uh, from anywhere of 23%, um, uh, you know, which I think is a very distinctive tradition from uh, the, this part of Southern India in this early period. And at the bottom, you're looking at um, a fourth century Deccan zinc coin ingot. Now, the other tradition that was really well developed in India was of uh, zinc extraction, the metallurgy of extracting uh, zinc metal. And I don't have time to go into it, but we do have some of the earliest um, uh, examples of retorts for smelting of zinc and extraction and so on from the Zawa region of Rajasthan which are uh, well dated to at least about the 10th century, 10th, 11th century uh, AD. But it's possible, it's likely that this goes back as well to earlier periods. But uh, this is one of the very few um, examples of metallic zinc, which are found this Deccan zinc coining got. But the uh, lead isotope ratios of this did not match Zawar. So it seems to be another raw source. Uh, but it's, it, it also, um, because I'd also done, um, compositional and trace element analysis and the fingerprinting also involved a com combination of lead isotope ratios and trace element analysis. I've given talks about that later, but it does seem to very well fit another Andhra brass oil lamp, the lead isotope ratios and so on, 
which was also a brass uh, lamp that you're looking at here from the Victor and Albert Museum with 13% zinc, 8% lead and 11% tin. So it was a source that was known to Southern India and the trace elements also uh, matched the Vishnukundan coin because of the copper source being the same. So the, the Southern Indian provenance seems to be, um, you know, uh, quite likely here. So there, it's possible that there was another source as well that needs to be explored, whether, whether it is in uh, which part of the subcontinent or elsewhere, we don't know. I, I think I, I uh, would have put in one more on the tin, but I think it was getting too much. So I think I should uh, stop there and uh, yeah. And the last one is just the thank you slide, of course, and so on, or the acknowledgement slide. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and uh, so very, uh, qu quite a lot of technologies that we've looked at. We've looked at sourcing. I just want to take, because uh, we did have some questions that came in even before the session. So if I can just address those first, and then I've got questions of my own, and I see there's been quite a, a discussion going on in, in the chat. And so if I just um, take uh, those questions first. So um, Anand Malaya asks, what can you tell about the origins of traditional Aranmula metal mirror of Kerala? Uh, there is uh, one example of a, um, a mirror from the Breeks collection from the Nilgiris, which is a flat mirror with about 30% uh, tin. And now the analysis that I did of the Aranmula um, metal mirrors from Kerala and so on is that it is actually, uh, you know, that very delta phase which they were preventing or trying to prevent, uh, you know, with the uh, beta bronze, the quenching and preventing the delta phase. So seeing that they were optimizing the delta phase in these Aranmula mirrors, you know, uh, deliberately aiming for uh, the optimization of the delta phase. So these have almost like 32, 33% uh, uh, tin in them where this delta phase forms. If you go back to that phase diagram, you see that it forms in a very narrow uh, range, composition range between 32 to 33% tin. Of course, specular mirrors were sort of known um, uh, and used for making lenses and all that in Europe in, by, uh, you know, which had about 30% tin, but they were not necessarily unleaded. But here they seem to have been aiming very much for this delta phase composition. Um, so, and, and I did find one more example from uh, one of the Asur uh, contexts, which had 32% in, but I don't know if that's a mirror. We do have the example of the, 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 the Nilgiri vessel, a Nilgiri mirror. So I, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be able to pinpoint, but uh, uh, well, I would say that it is quite a distinctive tradition. You say that they deliberately aimed for the Delta phase. What would the properties, is it because it increases the specularity or I mean, what, what would they have benefited from? The point is that delta phase, I mean, of course, silver is also a very reflective material, as you know, and so why not use just silver? But silver, as you know, it dents very easily. It warps very easily. And so if you've seen your face looks all warped and distorted. But this delta phase is also very, very hard. It has a hardness of about uh, 500 VPN almost, even harder than a normalized steel. So the hardness means that once you polish it, and it has a brilliant reflective surface and so on. So it has a really brilliant um, reflective uh, quality as well, and a point image. But the fact that it's also very hard means that the that the image is, uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't distort. You specifically said that um, that they aimed for the delta phase that has been avoided in, in yes. other contexts. So yes. they're, they're, they obviously had a, a particular characteristics in mind to say, okay, yes. that which is normally avoided, we are going to deliberately. So it's yes. that decision-making that I was really asking about. There is a deliberate, uh, you know, the functionality is related to the properties of metals. And this was what I was able to actually establish that because we generally think that they just randomly alloyed, uh, you know, in the past, whatever they could get and so on. But I think they had empirically they were empirically exploring what alloys would be suitable for what purposes and so on. So, yeah. Pasia Ghosh asks, is solvent cleaning preferable to corroded, uh, for corroded iron with malignant patina? If yes, then what kind of solvents can we use? I suppose, uh, you know, a lot of it they, they do with uh, distilled water. In India, of course, we 
don't have a lot of access to a lot of things. So they even use kerosene and stuff like that. So it, you know, it does, uh, uh, but a lot of washing with distilled water initially, you know. There was an uh, archaeological find uh, uh, with a, a, a iron with a patina and it had corrosion on it. What would you, what would you do with that? I think that you have to look at a particular example. There's not you know, any one fix you have to look at that particular uh, you know, type and what sort of materials you can afford and all the rest of it. There are a lot yeah. of these things. You know. So, uh, and then uh, Ashutosh uh, Pati, um, I'm, apologies if I'm not pronouncing your uh, name uh, exactly as uh, you would yourself, but uh, I'm doing my best. But Ashutosh uh, Pati, um, uh, it's, it's from tin and lead concentration in a bronze sample, how to calculate the age of a sculpture. Or is it possible to calculate? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, I mean, he's asking if the concentration of tin and lead in a in a bronze could tell you anything about the age of the sculpture. As I'm, I'm assuming he's asking, uh, for example, if in a particular period they use certain concentration, and in a later yeah. period they might have used a different concentration. That's sort of now thing. actually that was the basis of my own uh, major uh, PhD thesis work on South Indian bronzes, where um, uh, the, the point is that if, for instance, you can see that they were using different um, compositions of metal in different times, then you could say it's more likely that if you find a, a bronze of a certain composition that it came from a certain period. However, I would say that with the uh, major elements, uh, you know, it can be a bit at random because at least in the South Indian bronzes I've analyzed, sometimes, okay, to a large extent in the earlier periods, I would say they use bronze and the later periods brass, but there are also some very early brasses as, as I showed you an example and so on. So it's a bit random with the major element alloying because that's intentional. So what becomes more important there is to look at the trace element profile. And in this case, the trace elements, uh, particularly those with our, which are very chalcophilic, which are, which, which are retained very strongly with the copper source. For instance, the trace elements of antimony, arsenic, bismuth, nickel, and cobalt. So these, um, and what I found was the profiling that there was a clustering particularly of these trace elements, and which also matched a bit with the clustering with the lead isotope um, you know, clusters. And so I could use that to, uh, as a sort of way of calibrating, uh, because of course, as you know, with metals, uh, you know, there's no absolute method of dating as you would with uh, carbon dating and so on. So that's why these relative dating by ca calibrating the uh, either the trace element compositions or the major element, if they uh, you know are very controlled, or the lead isotopes, all of these become useful, especially with the South Indian bronzes, which are solid cast. If they were hollow cast, I mean, the hollow casting technique was used more widely. It was used quite a lot in Northern India also, but of course, very much in the Hellenistic world, where to reduce the use of metal, they would have used a hollow core and then added the wax model on top of it so that the clay core gets retained. And of course, then you have other techniques that you can use for the dating of the clay core, such as the thermoluminescence dating, or if there's maybe charcoal, you could try uh, carbon dating and so on. But in the absence of this, all in the South Indian bronzes, that's why one had to look at the metallurgical profiling. Um, again, it, it is actually, uh, I mean, it's talking about uh, the Chalukyas territory um, and it's Arvind Seti is asking, uh, he's saying he'd be very interested in knowing what part of metals played in their economy. You know, under the Chalukyans, of course, you had um, a lot of these trade guilds and so on coming uh, to the fore because the, the Chalukyans, were one of the major early dynasties in South India. You had, uh, you know, the uh, Ayavale is also supposed to refer to some of the trade guilds. And again, they were, you see some of the Chalukyan influence also far away in, in Southeast Asia and Cambodia and that style of the uh, Natesha or the Natraja, which reminds you of that very beautiful um, depiction also in Badami. So, um, uh, and, you know, you find a lot of the copper plates coming into use, um, you know, in, 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 under the, in the Chalukyan period and so on. So they were using the copper plates, uh, you know, uh, for uh, mentioning these donatory inscriptions and so on. And I actually, in my analysis, of course, a lot of it, since I was really primarily looking at the, uh, uh, when we say South Indian bronzes, in, in this case, a lot of them are probably from the Tamil region because you have the uh, the early historic and the Pallava and then Chola and Vijayanagara. 
And I mean, it was such a prolific tradition and they're often the Vijayanagara is very hard to tell apart from the Chola and so on. So that's why these techniques uh, had become, uh, you know, it was important to try and see how to characterize these. And as you know, um, many, uh, there's been a lot of cases of illicit trafficking of these bronzes, you know, bronzes going missing from temples and all the rest of it. So that was why there was this urgency for this kind of authentication. But I did also actually analyze some copper plates because the copper plate charters, uh, you know, uh, because they are well dated, because with the bronzes, many of them being deities, uh, they don't have any kind of donor inscriptions or whatever, but with the cha copper plate uh, charters, they are better dated. So I actually did include some uh, Pallava copper plates, and Chola copper plates and so on, so that, the, you know, that also helped in terms of the, 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 the characterization. And I would love to do more work, certainly on the Deccan, and I did do some, but including Chalukyan and so on. Uh, but, you know, as with all these of these things, it's the problem of getting access to samples, you really need yeah. to have very enlightened curators and, and all the rest of it. Yeah, and access to very expensive Equipment to yes. analysis and all yes. that. So, yeah. well, actually, where, where is the where are you doing the analysis? So, uh, is it is it at the NIAS? Is it at the National Institute of Advanced Studies? Or uh, well, we have two access labs. Uh, you know, in, yeah, we yeah. have some. Uh, we also, of course, we are on the campus of the Indian Institute of Science, so we do have uh, you know the access to SEM and EPM and so on, and uh, you know we're hoping to uh, improve and all that. But some of the, yeah, but some of those very uh, high end techniques are, of course, very well developed abroad. So I think with these kinds of subjects, you do need to have a lot of collaborations. You showed the the, the little uh, the diagram uh, of uh, the trace elements and the uh, different isotopes of uh, primarily lead. Um, and but if you want to do, do, do you want to uh, and what sort of investigations have we done on some of the uh, some of the mines that are available in in India, for example, and and nearby? What sort of work do you want to? Are you able to elaborate a little bit about that? Uh, you know, there still needs to be a lot of basic data on the mines, uh, for instance, in India. It's not exhaustive. Some yeah. of that data was actually going back to the 80s. And then a few, uh, you know, because the thing is also with the thermal ionization mass spectrometry, uh, it's a very sensitive technique, but it also needs to, you need to have ultra clean rooms and so on. And, and the current... Um, dating, uh, you know, for, I mean, for the calibration, uh, you know, which, which uses these NBS standards and all that. So sometimes, you know, the, you have to also, the old dates may or may not be, I mean, the old uh, uh, isotopic ratios may not be up to that kind of mark and all that. So using the current hmm. standardized techniques, there's still a lot of work to be done for all sources. Um, of course, but uh, there's been a, a lot of interest, of course, uh, because in the Harappan material and some work has also been done there in identifying some of the sources in Pakistan and so on. But I think, again, there's not that much work. Uh, there's, uh, you know, some work is along the way, but much more needs to be done in Southeast Asia and so on. China, again, there's been some work. Japan has, there's some good work there under the ISO operations. But I think, for instance, my work on the artifacts, I don't think much has been done, um, you know, apart from that on in terms of the ISO ratios of yeah, so artifacts from the Indian subcontinent. So yes, there's a lot of Lots of potential for future potential. exciting yes. research. Yes. Yeah. yeah, hopefully uh, maybe some of the students here will yes. undertake some of that. Um, yes. You mentioned your grandmother um, and her, and, and I think grandmothers are brilliant for gaining insight. Uh, oh, into, absolutely. You know, and yeah. uh, um, the incentive to have a produce something that's initially thick that you then make so thin that it breaks um what is the sort of from a practical what would be a practical incentive for for people to go to that degree of effort to produce something that will then become more breakable than originally. I mean, as I said, some of those objects almost look like they've come from outer space. They're just so, so fragile and thin. And uh, but I don't know whether it's also sort of related to some kind of fascination with, you know, you know, jewelry making. And if you saw that uh, Adi Chenalur um, 
you know, that mouthpiece, the gold repousse, again, that was so fine, you know, it's less than uh, less than a millimeter, really. So, and, and perhaps the skill was already there, but obviously there was uh, some kind of aesthetics because, uh, you know, it, the, 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 you know, one can think of the ritual or whatever, but some of those trainers, I mean, they are quite extraordinary, you know, skill, yes, but also quite yeah. really very elegant as well. Mm. So a very kind of, yeah, rather unexpected to have that kind of sense of aesthetics, perhaps. But I think it, you know, the other thing that, of course, when you look even at at, at Harappa, I mean, Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, the, the classic, let's say, Indian civilization or whatever, what strikes me as being so different from others, let's say, Mesopotamia and Egypt and China and you know, this real working with miniaturization, you know, if you see the beads, the gold beads are so, so tiny, like, you know, one millimeter gold bead and so on. And, mm. and uh, even the Mohenjara dancing girl, she's so tiny and everything is as if they were, I don't know, were they very short sighted, but they certainly seem to excel in, in working in miniature, working in a very fine way. Whereas if you see that in China, it's already by the Shang dynasty, you have huge, uh, you know, vessels and things like that. So I don't know whether it's that, that skill of working in in, in very uh, that it's, fine it's sort of way, yeah, and an aesthetic that's passed through. Passed yes, down. perhaps that yeah. or a skill yeah, of yeah, yeah. But it's I a mean, very can, interesting can, and uh, fascinating question. I can't yeah. say I guess I've answered it. In, and even the beads, if you see the even the glass beads and all the rest of it in the Indo-Pacific beads that you see a lot of also in the Tamil region and all, really really tiny, you know, but very skilled. Do you have examples before the thinning? of them being of that same standard, but thicker. Well, you see, now they don't have the skill to make it quite so fine, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, you know. But one thing is there that I, I think that the, um, I think that the, the, the more you forge it, the more the property of the Martin site is, it comes to the fore in terms of, you know, the strength and the tensile strength uh, from a technical point of view. I mean, and bear in mind also, you know, uh, height and bronze went out of vogue quite a long time back, or they were never really used much in the Western world. So they've not really been studied that much. Mm. So this is, you know, there could be other potential applications if, if we did go back to this material. But I believe that the property also improved by that exquisite kind of forging. It actually became quite uh, tensile strength, hardiness, and maybe the luster, all of those. So I think it is also the the, the fact of the properties being in, in, in Yeah, no, I, I was just wondering if it, if it was sh something yeah. that shattered, whether there were other things. It's only if you really deliberately broke it or deliberately dropped it or something. But otherwise, I think oh, they're right. quite okay. sturdy. Okay. And the other thing is also that actually they're quite corrosion resistant, you know, because mm -hmm. if you see many of the other, the lower tin bronzes, a lot of them uh, have corroded. There's almost no core material also and many of them left and all but you see because this beta is an intermetallic phase you see it's it's uh, it's a compound yeah mm -hmm. so yeah. actually it, it ensures that it is much more corrosion resistant and that's how some of those have actually lasted so long if they hadn't made it thinner and thinner um it, what, what um disadvantage would they have had if they had left it as quite a thick piece i'm assuming because it would be quite heavy to work with yeah. And, and well, you know, uh, um, one thing is also, I don't know about, it's also a question of how much metal they had. And of course, in recent times, like you saw that recent vessel, which is actually uh, a much sturdier and, and, and much thicker, you do get thicker examples as well. But you know, the thing is that actually, I, I think also the the homogeneity is, is um, the key that probably... The thicker ones would be more cast and 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 quenched, not so much of forging in them. I don't think. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway, I think these are all new things to think about because you know you're exactly. always finding now. For instance, I didn't go into it, but with the uh, steel, for example, now one one is looking at the nano wire, cementite, and so many other things. So as you go yeah. along, you might find there's there's uh, you know more reasons for it, and and you know there were also. Um, they, they, they were also using a lot of mica as well, you know, which again comes in thin sheets. So where that inspiration to look at, you know, the thinness and uh, the, like there was. And that was, you, you believe that the mica was deliberately introduced rather than being. I think so. I think so. Other, I think they had 
yes, sources that they so. used. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Some of them which were strainers with the with the holes. So perhaps, of course, the very thick ones, you know, it, it would not have had that same function as a, if, if we do call it a strainer or whatever. When was the lost wax t- technique first used in India? I showed that my Moinjadaro dancing girl sure. right at the beginning because, uh, you know, that's a three-dimensional casting. Yeah, yeah. And I would have assumed that finesse, that's, that's... Even though it's really tiny, but um, uh, you could not have done that by a two-piece mold other, or whatever. Yeah. So that's a clear, I think, uh, sign that they were using... Mm-hmm either a lost resin or a lost wax process. Um, I should also add, of course, just to conclude on what we're talking about, the, the very finely forged bronzes. And the reason why I'm stressing all that is because um, you see, it's generally assumed that there was not much of technological skill in you know, that material. Whereas this, in fact, defies that logic and points to a very, very high degree of sophistication, which in that kind of material you're not finding elsewhere. So it was also made more to make that point that this is something which is really quite unexpected that the technology actually sometimes yeah. can, can uh, disrupt your notions of what you know about the archeology span or the history. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, um, yeah. And, uh, and so coming back to the lost wax, yeah. So, but then, um, uh, I mean, in the post Harappan period, you actually don't see much of, uh, you know, metal figurines or whatever in that uh, same way. You do see a, a few more, but none of quite the same skill as that particular uh, Moinjadaro dancing girl, as we call her. And then it, it again reemerges, but more in the... And so in, in a way that Adi Chinlur, uh, Mother Goddess, is also a bit of an exceptional find. There aren't too many like that in that in that interim or that heritage. And then in the early historic period, again, you see lost wax images coming. But here there is a, you know, a clear... Um, Impetus also from the Hellenistic world, you know, with the figurines, Buddhist, Jain, and so on, and uh, and both in the, but but I would say it's not as conventionally you'd think of the Northwest as being where it actually emerges. But again, I think there is the impetus also from the the maritime route because yeah. you get quite an early and very fine Buddha image from Kaveri Patanam also, which is um, you know. Uh, uh, quite early about, uh, uh, again, a Sangamera site of about the, you know, first century bronze. or whatever. Yes, yes, bronze, a yeah. small one, yes. And and then the tiger figurine from Kodumanal. Now, again, that's why that was also interesting because that seems to, again, have been a lost wax casting. Though I showed you that little tiger figurine with the carnelian and lapis inlay. Yeah. Uh, and you do see these kinds of small animal figurines coming in. And when we look at those, uh, the finial, the, the Auroville with the finials and all that on top. So I think the top part of it, that again shows that they were using what seems to be, I don't think those are all forged, those were lost wax. So again, you know, although now these are not, and mm. uh, this in a way perhaps uh, is, can be separated from the Hellenistic influence because it's so very distinctive, and, you know, seem to have a very local character, but it seems to be making a come back or it's been, and you also of course have another exceptional hoard from Daimabad, which we think of as later up when you have an elephant and a rhinoceros from Maharashtra, yep. which uh, again, so perhaps some residues of that. Warfare is often a, a major catalyst to technological development. Um, have you, uh, is there anything that you could shed light on on, on that there's so much more work needs to be done to you know to, to, to understand all of this but the interesting thing of course with the the Harappan repertoire you know you see that there are a lot of bronze chisels and so on but nothing that I mean not much really that that people could say is really uh, associated with warfare and I think you see much more of that for instance in the Assyrian context, even those bar reliefs and everything, they're showing people fighting all the time. So that's generally what is believed. But then the the copper hoard material now, uh, what is interesting also with you know, the finds from Sanauli is that they think that there's the, the copper antony sword, what was earlier thought to be a ceremonial sword. Now there's also a bit found which is below that, which could form a hill. So it could have been uh, you know a, a weapon and so on. And, and that's also been quite interesting, as I said, the chariot burial with some copper elements. Of course, you do see chariot burials then and, and uh, you know, in, enormous numbers of them, for instance, in China and, you know, probably the Caspian and all the rest yeah. of it. So we need to unpack all of this and see how, you know, what connections these, there might be. Yes, and I think yeah. more analyses and all yeah. the rest of it, of yeah. course, would yeah. be good. But, you know, it's all 
subject to a lot of, you know, you know, it is difficult to, it's a difficult subject really because A, getting samples is difficult, getting um, access to labs and, you know, the yeah. costs and grants, yeah. I mean, oh, just surviving yeah. and, and at the same time, there's enormous interest. So one's like having to answer all sorts of questions and all sorts of things. Oh, yes, no. 24-7. I, mean, I, I, I think, I think questions are also there for yeah. discussion rather than yes, knowing, absolutely. you know, having yeah. the answer today. Yeah, and, and for having the, yeah. you know, the final yeah. answer, it's more to think yeah. about these exactly. issues. And, and it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's about looking at yeah. even directions that we could be, yeah. you know. Yeah, and, and you know, the other thing I, sh I would like to say is that, you know, this heightened bone story, I mean, there are so many of these kinds of stories as I said, you talk to your grandmother and all, but then you see there's another major thing is that many of the traditional workshops, because the cost of uh, metal is so prohibitive, I mean, that heightened bronze workshop survived exclusively by melting down the old vessels, old yes. heightened bronze vessels, because they, they can recognize one type of material. They know a heightened bronze vessel when they look at it. They know it's different from a leaded bronze or a brass or whatever. They have that much of, uh, you know, astuteness. And now, for instance, even, even I can tell. And so they, they selectively get those from the scrap merchants and they're just melting it down. And they, a lot of them are actually you know, antiques or heritage pieces. And this sort of yeah. thing has been going on really through centuries because yeah. maybe because in India also, we didn't have, you know, that market, a burial tradition like you did in Egypt or, you know, in elsewhere. So a lot of metal has got remelted and it's happening even today. So please go and talk to your local scrap merchant or, you, you know, your local villages to not give away those implements <laughs> or those, uh, those metal pieces. Yeah. Just All I'll say now is thank you, Sharada, for uh, coming and giving us such a, um, a wide ranging comprehensive talk about uh, that uh, looks at uh, current practice, uh, archaeological excavation, and, um, and, and, and also uh, some of the uh, uh, metallurgical analysis that you conduct yourself uh, and, and sharing some of those with us. So thank you so much. And thank you everybody for, for, for coming today. And I wish you all um, keep safe and um, uh, a nice, lovely rest of the evening and uh, rest of the day and Sunday. All right. Good night. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Ivanisa. Yeah. It's been a real pleasure. It's been wonderful. And thank you.